Okay, uh, good morning. Um, this is Linguistics 11, Introduction to Linguistics, and this is my first video for the class, introducing the class. Um, and it's an important video. There'll be three really important videos, the introduction to the class, the study video for um, the midterm, and the study video for the final. And I'll have some shorter videos introducing things throughout the semester. Um, first off, well, before I get to the syllabus, which is important, um, I do have at the top of everything, you can contact me through email. And it's my first and last name, Moroku Nemeth, at whccd.edu um, anytime. If you have a general question that you think other people in the class may have as well, you can just leave it here. Um, my 24 seven asynchronous office hours, not my name for it, but you know, it's just a place where you can leave questions that maybe anybody else has. And I can answer them publicly. I mean, unless it's private, a lot of the times um, I will make an announcement based on those questions that you send me if I think other people uh, may have the same question as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can, you know, look at, you know, or approach the, 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 the course. Um, I like to go through modules, um, and go to the week and I numbered off the weeks, week one, week two, etc. And, um, I put in a date, whatever semester, you know, I'll put it in the dates. Um, and, but there is another way you can go. Um, there are a couple, I will set the, right now the homepage is, is the modules, so it's the same. But then there is a way to, I will start doing it pages. So every week we'll have, that's the week one page, right? The welcome page. Um, and I'll go over this today. Um, there is also though, one thing that I found, I mean, it depends on how you, you know, what works for you. you know, you'll get some what's due, right? And the right, um, margins but you can also go down to view calendar and you can see what's due that way right um it kind of lays it out and i generally stagger things um so that they're due at different times in the week um with the the due date for the weekly things usually on sunday night and it says eleven fifty nine. that's what it says um, you know, in my syllabus, I have a lot of things, um, but one of the things I have is, you know, a late work policy and, and, um, generally there, my late work policy is the late work, the due dates are more, um, recommendations than set in stone rules, you know, so you can pace yourself and learn things one after another kind of in a sequence but um you know um and, and i will give zeros if things aren't turned in but you can make things up you know it's not like last chance um and i just want to make sure that's clear um let me so i have the week one now, one of the things, there's a lot of places you can look for the syllabus. Um, here I have a download, you know, and this will be the welcome page. Um, this is online, asynchronous, so I can't technically require you to be in a Zoom meeting at any time. I'll probably offer Zoom meetings and office hours weekly, um, but you don't have to attend them. Um, okay, so I have caught, I have taught this course... Uh, I think 21, 22 times, something like that. 
maybe more since 2016. Um, and what I found out is that a lot of people entering the class, significant portion, are just kind of required to take the course and they don't know what linguistics is, let alone all the different sub areas of linguistics, uh, subfields and all that. And what you'll see is that, um, you know, from looking at the course, there are a lot of subfields and sub areas of linguistics. Um, and like the original textbook I was using had like, yeah, well, we made people buy a textbook when I started when I took over the class here at West Hills, uh, now Lamore College. They'd had 20 sub areas of linguistics that I was supposed to cover in the semester. And I've pretty much, you know, I've, I've kept that. Different ones have different uh, levels of emphasis and whatever. But linguistics is language study. And some of it's pretty much art. Some of it's pretty much science. It just depends on the discipline. And you will, I think, have a pretty interesting and wondrous journey into the world of linguistics in the class. Um, it's really interesting. There's so much to learn. And it will change how you see and I think enjoy a lot of aspects of reality. Um, and I don't think that's hyperbolic. When you go to the syllabus, um, I don't. What you're going to find as you post things in um, Canvas is that you can really meticulously organize everything in your document, and then you transfer it over into Canvas, and it just messes it up totally. <laughs> this isn't an English class, thankfully, because in an English class, like say if I'm trying to show students what MLA is, you know, I, I usually have to take a picture of you know a, a screenshot or something and put it as an image into um, the Canvas text box because the formatting will get thrown off invariably. And it's really frustrating. But so I'm saying that because um, I would prefer that you download the PDF and read it uh, than the one that's formatted in Canvas as far as like accessibility and, and how it looks and overall presentation. I'm not saying it's perfect, but still, uh, it's better. So, course syllabus, a couple things. Uh, first off, my first name is Moroku. Um, it's a Japanese first name because it looks, I mean, you may wonder, right? Where is that? What is it from? Um, it's Japanese, and, you know, um, and Moroku is a type of bodhisattva, uh, enlightened. You know, they're supposed to be uh, come to bring a golden age of enlightenment in future period. Um, and after my father, you know, who served as a combat medic in Vietnam, he got interested in Eastern religions and philosophy, and as part of Vietnam veterans against the war and against imperialism and kind of all the colonialism, neo-colonialism, all the prejudices that come with it. And so he named his firstborn son Moroku. Now in Japanese, you don't really say Miroku, right? The R is different. It's more like um, most of the Japanese speakers I know who have asked how do I pronounce my name, they're more like Miruk. You know, it's 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 not Miroku, it's Miruk, you know, something like that, which I don't really say exactly right um but still it's interesting to know uh, now there is what happened in in the 90s late 90s early 2000s people started to people more of the early 2000s more americans got into anime and there was anime called inayasha and that's moroku from the inayasha right and all of a sudden these people were like Oh, that's a cool name, Roku. Before only people and that was people who watch anime, and before that, only people who knew my name were usually people who knew Japanese or about Buddhism or Japanese Buddhism and art um, and things like that. First name is Roku. My last name is Nemeth, which means the German and Hungarian. My great grandparents on my dad's side from Hungary, and my mom's side are old, older, you know. 
um, descendants of uh, European settler colonizers, um, mostly from Pennsylvania and, um, I don't know, English, German, French, a whole bunch of West Germanic type people. Um, anywho, that's, you know, I have a master's in linguistics. I got 96 um, and a master's in English literature, um, focusing on post-colonial studies and the Orientalism, the representation of um, the people of um, well, the Orient, the Middle East, and North Africa primarily, but lots of other people who are subject to European colonialism and imperialism. Um, and it, and and even though it's it's English, it's really very related to linguistics because we do look extensively at language and power, and there's a lot of that in my syllabus, and there's a lot of that in the class. Um, so, um, yeah, I gave the email and a little bit about me. I mean, I've taught for, I started teaching in 95. I started teaching, I had taught before that, but as far as at an educational institution where I'm getting paid in 95, I started teaching at the American English Institute at CSU Fresno. I started teaching international students and, um, I taught ESL there and then International English Institute. And then I taught at Fresno City College, ESL, people from like 13 different countries. Really interesting. Um, and um, after I taught ESL a little bit, I ended up going back for a teaching credential in English and started a master's. And I uh, started teaching English at Madera Center and some other community colleges, um, as well as high school a little bit. Um, 2000 to 2002, I taught um, English as a foreign language in Saudi Arabia, one year in Riyadh and one year in Dammam uh, at the Ma'ahad Al-Aidar al, al, al -Amma Institute for Public Institu uh, uh, Administration, English Language Center, which was a pretty uh, interesting experience, to say the least. And um, came back and I finished my credential. I had finished my second master's after writing like a 200 page thesis. And uh, I taught at Reedley College ESL. I taught many different community colleges. I taught high school for a year at Sanger. I taught high school English. And then I taught ELD and ESL for Kalinga High School for 14 years. Um, I taught at several different colleges. Right now, I've been teaching, this will be for 14 years uh, for West Hills College. And since 2016, I've been teaching um, linguistics continuously. Every summer, every fall, every spring. Um, and I, I love it. It's, 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 it's great. It's an interesting, it's a it's a blessing to be able to teach linguistics. I really enjoy it. Um, so what is linguistics? Now, there's the definitions. They're very kind of long and, and broke, broken down. Um, and, and please read it at your own, you know, leisure. The thing is like, um, you know, this is a survey course where I'm introducing you to linguistics. And what I want you to do, you know, learn what you need to learn. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to test you on. I'm going to go over it over and over again. But there's all these ways in which you can take deep dives and you can go into all kinds of things on your own. And I really want that to be, you know, what you take away because I don't want you to just learn for a course, pass the course. I want you to learn and I want you to pass the course. I want you to get a good grade, everybody. And I will work with, if everybody gets a good grade, if there's 50 people that all get an A, I'm cool with that. You know, I, I don't need a, a freaking bell curve, man. You know, I'm not a eugenicist or something or some, you know, bigoted idiot who needs to reaffirm my ideas about humanity and some humanity needs to fail. Quite the opposite. So, um, you know, 
just contact me, keep in touch. Let's, let's all do well in this. And the thing is, you know, you, you guys are going to be teachers, a lot of you, or go into speech pathology or go into something else that usually, you know, you're dealing with human beings and, and, um, you know, linguistics can give you a real appreciation for the intelligence and creativity of all human beings. And um, it can also break down and destroy a lot of prejudices that people have about that are language based. And it's, it's pretty, you know, pretty amazing and wonderful is that. So I, um, you know, there is a, a, a um, OER book, right? Um, Catherine Anderson's um, Essentials of Linguistics. Now, the only problem with this book, and I'm, I like the first edition better than the second because it goes into deep dives that are a little bit beyond the scope of what this class is supposed to cover. So there's some really great stuff. Um, and I like because it basically it has videos and then it has it has videos and then it has text and it has embedded questions. Um, you know, and it has things like, well, linguistics is a science. Well, yeah, yes, some of it's a science. Some of it's art, you know, <laughs> depends on what part. Um, if you're trying to elevate it into a pure science, well, a lot of things that aren't really pure sciences, they say that they're sciences and that's not really following the scientific method, whatever. Um, you know, thinking as linguists, producing speech sounds, transcribing pre-speech sounds. So speech sounds basically it's phonetics, transcribing them will use a, there's an international alphabet, international phonetic alphabet uh, that we use. Speech sounds in the mind, psycho and neurolinguistics, two different uh, learning sounds. There's also how sounds interact with each other beyond this, the small sound unit, that's phonology. Um, word forms, now this could be a lot of things. One of them is basic elements, that uh, what they call morphology, something if you're an elementary school teacher, you'll be doing a lot of that, like word roots and prefixes and suffixes and stuff like that. Combining words, word formation, Again, that's morphology. Forming sentences, well, combining words could be what they call syntax, grammar and syntax, and uh, sentence meaning and structure, basic line, that's that's what they call uh, semantics. Um, more about meaning, there's entire disciplines like um, pragmatics that deal with like, what are you really saying behind the words? And there's a whole chapter on indigenous languages that's really good in this um, that I, I like a lot. Um, so that's the book we'll be using. We'll be using some of it. I just want to show you the link. You can download it. You can access it anytime. The four, this course student learning outcomes. Um, the first one, identify speech sounds in terms of voicing, place, manner of articulation, and apply IPA symbols. So IPA is International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, you know, it looks a bit different. It is based on European models. I mean, linguistics, as we've inherited it and, and, and institutionally, is a European. It's a it's a European based quasi science, part science, part not science. Uh, that was really part of anthropology and 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 and, and went hand in hand with anthropology. It also went hand in hand with European colonialism. So some of it, you know, goes into the 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 eighteenth century, but with the rise of the East India Company, um, and then some of it goes um, and, and British colonialism in a lot of ways. And some of it goes most of it goes to the nineteenth century, like a lot of our Western sciences. And I'll give you some resources about structural racism and and academia later on the syllabus um if you're interested in that but um so the ipa is like a they tried to you know they tried to get an alphabet that is loyal to sound and you could say well anybody from any background could use this alphabet to understand how things are i mean there were a lot of cultures that actually were way ahead of western europe in linguistics um centuries before but that's what we've inherited is the IPA symbols, you know, useful in transcribing English. Um, 
I'm not going to require you to be totally fluent in those. That 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 takes its whole own class in phonetics. And um, you know, this is a general introduction. Uh, second uh, CSLO is construct morphological analysis on English word structure. This means breaking down words. This can be really cool. Um, you know, one movie I'd recommend is if you haven't seen it, it is uh, no problem. Mm -hmm. The Professor and the Madman, which is probably the only movie with Mel Gibson's, I would say, actually is, you know, kind of historical merit. It is based on, um, yeah, the tale of a tale of murder and sanity and the making of the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's a really it's 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 about a Scottish professor who was autodidact. I mean, he ended up taking um, on Oxford's project of trying to map the history of every word in the English language. And um, an American medical doctor who was a veteran of the Civil War and was really uh, he had PTSD really bad <laughs> from the war. Um, and he was actually he. he, he he murdered a man because he thought it was a man who was trying to come kill him. And it was another man. And he was in an institution um, in England. And he, well, he helps him to start finishing the Oxford English Dictionary. It's an amazing book and an amazing um, uh, story. Uh, excellent movie. And it has to do with word words and the history of words, what they call etymology, which I find really, really fascinating. Um you know, it's something I read on myself. Etym etymology, etymology con. It's really harder to say, you know. A circular stroll through the hidden connections of the English language, you know, where it's just, you know. It's, um, yes, I read on stuff. So, so uh, third, if you teach, like, if you can learn the history of words, right, and where they came from, and there's stories behind them sometimes. It really can make teaching more interesting. It can make learning more interesting, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the third one is composed grammatical analysis on a phrase and clauses. And, clauses. Um, and we'll do a little bit of that. And I'll expose you to all, a lot of the stuff you need to know. But it can get, you know, again, that's, that's syntax. And you can take undergraduate and graduate level courses in that. And still really be far behind you know, the cutting edge of it. Um, but there are actually lots of jobs looking at um, having knowledge in syntax and linguistics that tie into uh, data and everything from AI to data analytics, uh, you know, computational linguistics. There are a lot of jobs in it uh, right now uh, with the expansion of AI and, and it does involve linguists. Okay, and then the fourth one, analyze first and second language acquisition. So if you're a child development major, you're teaching kids, you have kids, you, I don't know, been around kids at all, <laughs> uh, you know, look or, or learned your first language yourself, it can be really interesting to look at that. And then second language or third language or multiple language now is, is kind of what they're being more respectful to learners because half the population of the world it, knows at least two languages and a third of the population of the world knows at least three uh unlike uh, many americans who are pretty much monolingual you know the ugly american who wants uh everybody to speak english and you know to serve american food everywhere in the world right um anyway so the, a lot of course objectives like this is probably more than you ever seen and the thing is with linguistics there's a lot of terminology that I, so if I read a lot of these to you, it's not going to make a lot of sense until after you've learned a bit. Uh, but it is there. Equity statement, really important. Equity is really important to me. Um, you know, I work with a lot of groups. Uh, I work with, um, you know, p groups that people may know uh, who, who, you know, from Veterans for Peace to Peace Fresno uh to you know ice out of fresno when it was around uh immigrant groups um immigrants right groups uh, other groups for just social justice and um you know linguistics is is a place where you just learn to value everybody in total and 
it's pretty important, um, you know, I think for teachers and everybody else to just, you know, love and care for people and, the, and, and them learning. And so equity statement, I, I think it's a pretty good, you know, equity statement. I want to read all, all of it. Um, this book, um, it's an initial, I know some people involved in this project. Um, it is not perfect, uh, for example, but it's good. It's a good start. So you can, it, it's, you know, um, you can download it, you scroll down a little bit, people's history of structural racism in academia from administration of justice to zoology, um, and one of my friends is a professor. Uh, well, she quit Stanford. She she has a PhD from uh, Harvard and um, quit Stanford because of some of silly things of the politics there and the lack of commitment to people's struggles. Um, just like nominal kind of superficial clout kind of commitment and not real commitment. But um one of my friends, she, she knows the one of the Susan Rahman. So it, it's a it's a great book, um, and they you know they deal with uh, linguistics as well as a lot of the other ones. It's a starting point. Um, anything the People's History kind of series, really great. Uh, I have a diversity statement. I have a statement on um, one of the things we were looking at is like language and power. Uh, what they call hegemony or the control of ideas and language and, and and discourse like what is talked about what isn't right in institutions in centers of power and um one of the things that's always kind of stigmatized is you know non-standard english right because there are a lot of different dialects of english all around the world you know you can look at a map of Indo-European languages of European languages, and you see they're all in these, all these corners of the world because by the uh, late nineteenth century, eighty-five percent of um, the world's populated and unpopulated landmass was claimed by people of European descent, by European-based or um, empires. Eighty-five percent of the world, like you know, Britain, the empire upon which the sun never sets. Now, there's all kinds of dialects of English, but only certain of them are respected, you know, um, institutionally and academically. And the thing is that, and they're seen as superior inherently, and they're not, you know. Um, and so... You know, I'm an English teacher, and one of the things that I love about linguistics as opposed to English is that in linguistics, you challenge um, those relationships of dialect and language to power. And in English, you reinforce them, and teaching English is often a colonial and colonizing endeavor where you're reinforcing uh, certain kind of class structures. Though in America, we don't talk about class at all, but it's very much a reality. Um, so this talks about uh, actually some of the community colleges I've been working with, um, I was working in, in some linguistic justice projects with the Puente program and other programs. And, um, they actually have, uh, Los uh, Pasitas College, English department at Los Pasitas College has a, 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 an official statement they put out that, um, you know, no dialect of English is superior to another, and that treating one is as superior perpetuates structural racism. And I really love this. So since I learned that, I have been using it in my classes. You will have an assignment on that. Um, attendance. The main thing with attendance is online class. So what you have to do is, um, you know. Log in and participate, turn things in. The first week, if you don't log in, you don't participate, I have to drop you. Um, if I see you for more, like a week or more, not participating, not turning anything in, because um, I can look at like page views as well as like actually turning things in, I'll probably send you an email 
And if I don't see that you're doing anything, you don't respond, then I'll drop you. Usually I can reinstate you. It's not that. It's just I don't want, I want to get, you know, if you're not going to work in the class, I want to get you out before the um, the W day, the, the withdrawal date where you, you know, or, um, where you can only withdraw with a W. And then after that, up to the point, you know, uh, where you can withdraw the W. I don't want you to get an F. Um, but, you know, always you can be reinstated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so communication. Um, email is the best way to get in touch with me. Other than like that 24-7 asynchronous thing is cool too. Um, and, you know, I say 24 hours for response allow up to 24 hours you know because sometimes i may take a break like i'm not obligated to answer uh emails on holidays or weekends uh but um you know that's when most people do their stuff so i will try to answer in those times um but in general i may answer it you know it depends if i get a notification and i wake up at two or three in the morning and i see it i may respond right then so there's a little joke about that it's um, from, yeah, uh, I, I do think like, you know, that's a page I follow online. And I think that if you're studying, um, you know, a subject, you know, look up some social media kind of uh, stuff on, on that subject and follow it, and especially what interests you. So you can, you can, you can keep learning after the class and in a class and all that. Um, okay. So. So I have a whole late work policy. You see that it's struck out. Basically, you know, I used to say, I don't know, you know, I have to take policies from, from, from the institution and I don't really get to do what I want totally or what I feel is right all the time. But I'm going to do what I feel is right as much as I can, right? And so like, Basically, late work, it's a it's a um, recommendation, right? Like to have things in on time. I will grade you down if you don't turn them in. I'll give them a zero. A couple of days after it's due, I'm going to start putting it up, put in zeros. You know, the first week, I may be a little, I, I usually wait a little bit for the first week so that students can turn in, um, you know, because sometimes people are adding late, whatever, whatever. Um, but, um, you know, you can make up the zeros, you can make up work. I know that people, um, sometimes are really struggling working two jobs, taking a lot of classes, just have craziness in their lives, have sickness, have family in trouble, whatever, man, there, there's a lot of things in life. And so I want to maintain a flexibility, you know, to help you get through this. That being said, you know, if you turn in things late, late, they pile up, right? And they pile up. And then when things pile up, then you feel like, man, how am I going to handle this? It's too much. And, you know, that can make it hard. And I don't, I don't want you to, uh, you know, lose hope either which way, you know? So, but the grades, look, gr the grades are pretty much, I use Canvas Gradebook. And so, you know, that's kind of cool in the sense that, like, everything will be in there. You can estimate your grade if there are things that you don't turn in and all this other stuff. You can do all kinds of things with the gradebook your own self. Um, and this is what's programmed into the gradebook, like 90 above is an A. If you're at 89.5, I'm going to give you the 0.5%, you know, like, um, you know, but anyway, that's 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 how they have it programmed, so um online postings in general you know um you know try to write in an academic way um you know it's the one place like the, the like like it's the one place where you're doing that is in school um you know it, it's not texting i know may some of you may be working on your phones that's cool but still try to do the thing so you're working in academic language so you know Capitalize your eyes, use punctuation, you know, distinguish between plurals and possessives, stuff like that, you know, 
Um, I'm not going to kill you on that, but I do want you to do it. When I say a paragraph two, I do want like about five to seven sentences, unless it's like a really complex sentence will be the equivalent of five to seven sentences. And I don't necessarily recommend that. So there's going to be, you know, a lot of assignments where you have, you'll have readings with questions. It's kind of straightforward. You'll have like on the subject, um, phonetics or sociolinguistics or psycholinguistics or whatever. Um, then you'll have videos um, and you'll take notes. And the notes, I really, so you can write in paragraphs if you like. You could do kind of informal notes. You can do formal notes. Usually I'll be wanting like, like for, there's a whole bunch of crash course linguistics ones that I really love. And uh, in general, I'll ask for like 10 notes on it, 10, 10, 10 facts, 10 things, 10 things about it. You could do Cornell notes. You could do all kinds of different things, but at least get like 10 things that are substantial in it, you know? And I don't like necessarily giving a formula for it um, because people really kind of do a diverse according to their own proclivities, kind of lay things out their own way, and it's cool. And I want to leave that open anyway. Uh, oops, okay. Beep, beep, okay. Yeah, okay. You, 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 yeah, even though I will try to drop you if it looks like you're falling behind, it is on you to drop. Yeah, um, you can take like the quizzes, like this two, the midterm and the final the exams, and take them multiple times. Discussion boards, Generally, there'll be about 20 points. It'll be like 16 points for your post, four points for uh, responses. And I know that having to respond to peers can 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 really, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't necessarily like it my own self a lot of the times. I mean, sometimes I do. I like the effects it can have in a class, um, democratizing the classroom and having you have conversations with other people in the class. But when I am asked to do it, for training for classes I take. I don't really like it my own self, you know, very much. So sorry for the hypocrisy and the tyranny of the system. Um, you know, it gives you a couple examples of what you'll be seeing. Um, social media as a learning tool. So there is going to be an assignment where, and it's up at the top here. Discussion board, collective learning, and a space for social media reels, memes, GIFs, videos, etc. relevant to coursework. So all you're going to do here is you can post. Um, you can hit reply and then post, you know, memes and other cool stuff that you find. Um, and... You know, I did this because so many people would email me about channels and they're like, hey, did you see this YouTube channel and something, something, something. Or, you know, we find, I find, you find, whatever. It's a way to keep things up to date and and fresh for the class. And, um, you know, in, invariably, you know, also, you know, you start changing your algorithm, right? In your Google searches or your um, social media, right? to incorporate more linguistic um, kind of things. Uh, anyway, I, excuse me, I think that, um, you know, there's no requirement. You have to do that to your social media or anything else. I'm going to recommend right away um, Sun Michaud, right? And this, again, aligns with my uh, you know, kind of philosophy about, well, not just mine, linguist philosophy, right? Um, let me see. Let me get this. In English, only broken rules intended to break unbroken people. We out you. Peace. There's no such thing as broken English. Only broken rules intended to break unbroken people. We out you. So, you know, um, I think that, uh, that what he's saying is really important, right? Um, there's no such as thing as, as broken English. Only broken rules intended to break unbroken people. Um, so... I would say, you know, follow him. He, he's, he's, 
he literally represents the 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 philosophy of of um the linguist really well um there are a couple of channels i highly recommend lang focus they have these like he has these 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 minute breakdowns of the of different languages and dialects and all these linguistic topics and what language came from what really amazing kind of work and dialects as well yeah i said that native lang a lot of historical a lot of little animated clips um when we look at the history of writing orthography you know writing didn't just arise in one place in the world it, it arose all kinds of places on all kinds of continents from you know china to central america to um africa in several different places uh, to the middle east or somewhere to the phoenicians who gave it to the greeks and anyway um native lang is really dope you'll be watching like 45 minutes of five minute clips talking about the history of, of writing which you know gives you anyway and this native lang is amazing kind of stuff there's a help desk for tech online stuff doing proper stuff academic honesty i have a little bit too much of the academic honesty stuff main thing is like um you know don't plagiarize and try to do your own work uh, you know uh i you know i you know when I, I used to lift weights and when i lifted weights i used to bench 400 but i didn't get to benching 400 uh and I used to max out at 370 every other day and pyramid up to it and pyramid down, which is kind of insane. But, you know, um, I didn't get to that point by just, I couldn't cheat it. You know what I mean? If you run, if you want to run 10 miles, if you're not putting your work, you can't just show up and run 10 miles. So you, you got to, your own abilities have to be your own abilities. And the problem with AI that it can become a crutch and you can use it, but it's not really you. I think it could be a great thing in the process of research. It could be problematic in research too. It could be a it could be a great thing in the drafting. It could be problematic in drafting too. Revising and editing, it's really beneficial. If you use something like Grammarly, et cetera, et cetera, I, I that's great. But don't let you know AI do your entire work. Um, you know do your work yourself you want to lift those weights yourself when it's time you know nobody else can lift them for you um and i really have you know dealt with plagiarism from the stupidest and most overt and laziest types of plagiarism to you know really really sophisticated and complex and you know um and i'm not saying i'll catch you every time because it's you know it's a lot especially with ai some of it's really hard to catch um and even things like turnitin.com, sometimes that, you know, that I found last semester, especially in my English classes, at the high, where I was teaching college classes in high school, they had a lot of false positives, you know, that it, where it would estimate almost be off about 20% about what was AI, you know, and it depends on, it, it's weird anyway. A whole bunch of policy stuff, links for DSPS, you know, disabled uh, students with disabilities, Dale students. I don't know if they're going to change that. Um, okay. By the way, Microsoft Pages sucks. Don't use it. If you can't avoid it. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Connection, basic needs, assistance. There are a lot of resources. Um, if you, you know, you're facing like hardship and life type stuff, you know, from the food pantry to um, you can get help sometimes in housing. Um paying bills, all kinds of other stuff. It's worth checking out and knowing about because, um, you know, a lot of times you just don't know there's help, you know, and so somebody got to put you up on game. Um, there is the Moja community, the Black students, African-American students. There is the Dream Center, resources for undocumented students. I've taught a lot of undocumented students, some of my favorite students who are now friends of mine. Are dreamers, and I don't think that to, you know, I don't think you have to be a dreamer to, you know, be loved and respected and be a part of society and deserve citizenship. But, you know, anyway, if you don't care about 
undocumented people and their struggles and immigrant people and their struggles. Uh, I don't think you should be teaching in the Central Valley, you know, because that's a lot of our population, you know, especially in rural areas. And they deserve love and respect. Now, a lot of professors uh, will um, put like this land acknowledgement about indigenous people into their um, into their syllabus. I find that to be, uh, well, my second wife was indigenous and indigenous activist. And, uh, you know, they find it kind of like, yeah, that's cute, but what are you really doing? What are you really about? You know, um, it's it, a lot of times it's performative and it avoids the real kind of accountability that you should have for living in a place where there was genocide. And so, you know, if you say, well, hey, you know, like, so usually what I, you know, what they usually put is I acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded and traditional lands of the Yoka people. And so and, and invariably that's, that's what I, you know, a lot of people would on their syllabus. So I put that, but I had to put like unseated. What does that mean? To seed something, right. To, to give it up. They didn't give it up. They didn't agree to it. Being it. But that's not really, you know, like the word isn't really adequate to describe what happened. Right? So in the brackets, I put stolen through deliberate genocidal policies of white settler colonizers, because that's what it was, right? It was a lot of violence. It was a genocide, according to the 1948 UN Convention on Genocide, which lays out what a genocide is. It was a genocide. Um. So, and then I, I kind of made a little bit more of a clearer statement. I acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded and traditional lands of the Yokut people. It is important to know that before Anglo-European colonization, their population uh, here was around, I'm sorry, here around 19, 1848 was 70,000. Because of the extermination policies of the California government, as clearly articulated, articulated by our first governor, Peter Brevinet, with the backing of the U.S. government, by 1880, the indigenous population of the Central Valley of California was only 600. So, yeah, there were 70,000, you know, Yokut people, which is a blanket name. It just means like the people, a blanket name for what were generally three different groups um, and of related groups, linguistically, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the extermination policy, that's what they call it, you know, the policy of extinction, extermination, uh, deliberate. By 1880, the Central Valley, they, they, they had killed, killed, I mean, killed with, like, scalp bounties, like, and not <laughs> uh, through passive means, necessarily through extreme violence. Um, so many of the indigenous people of Central California, there were only 600 left. So when you look at the Santa Rosa Rancheria and the Tachi Yokut, which is one of the three main branches of the Yokut, you know, that's what their people have been through. And there's a lot more. We'll get into it really the last couple of weeks in the class. I have some exercises on endangered languages and indigenous people, and then we'll go over California genocide and, and, and the Central Valley genocide a little bit too. So we have a live in a land that has been stolen from its indigenous inhabitants through a deliberate campaign of genocide. There can be no real stalking, tar, starting point for talks of ethics or morality in a society without, in our society without first acknowledging this fact. Great book on this is American Genocide by Benjamin Mast, uh, Madley, uh, The United States and the California Indian Catastrophe. And uh, that's a MODOC chief who, you know, after all this violence and genocide towards his people, had to fight against the U.S. government. Called him Captain Jack, and he was, you know, uh, the first prisons here were in California were built for, for Indians, for indigenous people, and you know Alcatraz and him and his captains, his his I mean he was his and his soldiers, the main ones were all executed at Alcatraz Island. This is kind of a map of some of the 
California tribal groups. So California was more linguistically diverse than all of Europe. I mean, it was a very linguistically diverse place, a very rich place, uh, pre-Spanish and pre-Anglo colonization. The mission systems were concentration camps um, and the Spanish mission system and the Spanish colonization which started in 1769, killed off half of the population of indigenous people. It was over, it was between 350 and 300,000. Um, they're not beautiful romantic places. They're places where if you exhume the, I've, I've, I've you know, sat in lectures with archaeologists who worked on the graves and their bodies and of the people who worked to death, really extremely hard conditions. And they fought and resisted, uh, but they didn't pierce the Central Valley um and the central valley there were, there were warriors here man uh, it, was, it was really amazing history i threw in a couple things at the end john trudell um who was american indian activist fbi had a giant file on him and said he's dangerous because he's so eloquent not that he did violence or anything else because he spoke so well this is an acknowledgement by dr king um of U.S. being born in genocide. And here's one of my famous, most favorite uh, writers, Bell Hooks, who, uh, queer and black, but also just amazing with her mm, love and empathy for human beings and their betterment. So, you know, just threw in some people and things into that hole. This is a really long exposition and I'm sorry for it, but I got to start the class out with somewhere. I hope you like maybe sped it up so you can like, you know, watch it. <laughs> um, you can watch it quicker. Um, that's what I usually do. So you do have um, the first week. We got our first day questions about linguistics. Um, we have where it just asks you, you know, just answer as best you can. Um, you know, about linguistics. And I know some of these you're not going to know because you don't, some of you may not know about linguistics, but just answer the best you can. Um, I hope watching this, you know, about language superiority. Crash course linguistics. What is linguistics? Take about 10 notes. Really dope series. I love crash courses. I watch them on my free time sometimes uh, because I love them so much. And the linguistics one is amazing. It's really, really beautiful. Um, then, you know, introductory questions from readings. Um, some of them come from the Essentials of Linguistics book. Some of them are coming from a cultural anthropology book. And you know, one of the, the CSLO, we're well, not the CSLOs, but the learning, the, the, the objectives is, you know, to tie this to, you know, language and humanity. There's so many things you can't study without language, whether it's, you know, it's very hard to study, say, you know, psychology or um, anthropology or sociology or so many different things without linguistics. So um, there's some great little, David Crystal is a, a English linguist, and um, really entertaining. He wrote a lot of books. I have a lot of his books on linguistics and they're cool. Um, Tower of Babel, the quest for, for the first language, you know, it takes the mythological, um, well, not stuff, I'm going to say mythological, but religious. Um, I, I didn't mean that as so like an attack on uh, any, uh, anybody who may believe in that. Uh, uh, but the the religious kind of um, explanation for language diversity um, and then looking at it from a more scientific uh, point of view. Um, and there's also things like I have my first kind of etymology assignment here, right? Um, you know, I'm all of us have um, our dialects. We have what we call an idiolect, meaning an idiosyncratic, a peculiar um, dialect that developed um, from us, <clears throat> um, you know, living in different places and speaking different dialects. So I'm from Michigan originally, um, but I moved to California when I was 15. 
And so I have some pronunciations that are uh, like from Michigan. Uh, and I'm from near Detroit. So near Detroit kind of sounds, sometimes can sound kind of like Chicago. And, you know, other times can sound a little different. Um, you know, when I see my family from Michigan, I don't really talk like them anymore. But some words is still there. And I'm from Central California. I've been here for a long time. So I say certain things like somebody from Central California. Um, and you may find people who are really... Like they want to correct you in your English because you don't speak the same dialect as them. Uh, I think it's better. It's, it's good. Just like being bilingual. It's good to be bi dialectical and tri dialectical. And I don't know how many quadrant dialectical. I speak a lot of dialects and they're all good. So like I ask a question, like, you know, how do you say, do you say Babel or Babel? And you look it up, you're going to find from Merriam-Webster online uh, that both are acceptable, you know, and that's how it is with a lot of things. A lot of people say, no, this is the only one way. And you can find out, no, there's more than one way. Look in it up, things like that. And then looking at the history of the word, where did we get this word um, Babel or, or Babel from? That's extra credit, but it's also something I want you to just kind of kick off to help you to look at things. Uh, Stephen Pinger is a cognitive psychologist, and he's, he's not necessarily a linguist, but that being said, he's written um, a really great book on linguistics um, that he published, uh, you know, 25 years ago or something. Um, and um, he's, he's a, this is a great introduction to linguistics. Uh, you know, not the mushroom coffee. I, I, don't, I don't do mushroom coffee. I haven't tried it. It may be great. I don't know. Um, but, you know, a couple things. So this is the whole, uh, this is a lecture. It covers a lot of stuff about linguistics that you'll need to know that you'll really get to know throughout the semester. So it's really important to do. I do want it done in the first week. Um, and there is a transcript for the entire lecture. If I can find this, I do try to get it because you, you know, if you, otherwise you're going to have to rewind and type it up. So here's the whole transcript and it should make things easier. Um, <clears throat> so and really how you want to format your questions and talk about the questions there. I don't, I don't, it's, you can, you can write, I said two to pay a three paragraph reaction, which, which would be great or take ample notes, whatever works for you, but just show you, you paid attention, show you learned something. And it's going to be something, this will be something you can return to when you're studying, when you're trying to learn everything. All right. I want to go to pages really quick. And then I think, I'm sorry, this is so long, but, yeah, I won't do this much. Actually, this should be the longest one the entire semester. I'll try to do like 10 or 15 minute ones, except for the reviews, the midterm and the final. Those will be like 45 minutes each. Um, okay. So the midterm and the final are comprehensive, but I made a Kahoot um, for the midterm and final. And the Kahoot has all the questions, almost all the questions that are on the um, final. Uh, some of them, you know, because you can only put so many words in it, they're a little bit sh uh, shorter, you know, but it covers all the things. Because you know what I hate? I, I hated when I take a class and it has a whole bunch of terminology and science stuff or science E stuff. And then you don't know what they're going to test you on. So I'm trying to tell you what I'm going to test you on. From the f if you want to find out now, you can do it. You know what I mean? Uh, everything from these are language maps. Like, you know, so you'll know. You'll, you're going to leave this course. You should know uh, what Finno-Ugric languages are from the Uralic Mountains originally. And then spoken in fin Finland and Hungary, right? Um, or... This is uh, different Turkic languages, right? Here, these are Nilo-Saharan. And, you know, this is Bantu languages. This is, uh, 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 you know, different indigenous. This is, I think, the Quechua languages. No, no, these are Mayan, sorry. Um, and, you know, here, like, you know, wow, these are Indo-European languages. I wonder how they got all over the world. Oh, yeah, guns and 
germs and steel, even though I don't like Jared Diamond. So, um, you know, Austronesian languages, um, you know, Afro-Asiatic, you know, I, I can read and, 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 and to some extent speak Arabic. Um, and anyway, there's a lot, you know, word formation, you know, place of articulation, you know, this is, you know, from, from the, from the epiglottis to the uvula, to the, to the, the, the velum, to the palate, to the alveolar ridge, um, you know, bilabial introduction. So you'll, you'll need to know some of the stuff. How do you, you know, um, and this is a game. You could play it as a game, right? So. Um, and then I'm going to have videos. Um, but I'll explain the midterms in the final. And honestly, I know I've been going on a long time. I think that should be enough for now. Um, oops. What, I, okay. Pleased to meet you. Um, and um, I look forward to working with you this semester. If you have any questions, just email me. All right. Thank you. Bye. more stop recording wait stop recording